Today, our lecture is about shoulder and elbow joints. We will go through anatomy, pathologies, and physical examination. First of all, the shoulder joint consists of four joints, the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the glenohumeral joint, and the scapulothoracic joint. Shoulder joint has a high range of motion, forward movement in the sagittal plane called flexion. For backward movement in the sagittal plane is extension. Sideway movement in the coronal plane is abduction and sideway movement toward the midline of the body in the coronal plane is adduction. Lateral rotation is rotating the arm away from the body. Medial rotation is rotating the arm toward the body and circumduction. The shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint. It is a shallow joint and it has a high range of motion that make the shoulder joint the most dislocated big joint in the body. Here we have the stabilizing factor of the shoulder joints. We have dynamic stabilizer, which is the most important stabilizer of the shoulder joint, and static stabilizer. We will go through the anatomy of the dynamic stabilizer. Dynamic stabilizer, the deep muscle group is the rotator cuff muscles. It creates a negative pressure inside the shoulder joints to keep the humeral head inside the glenoid. We have four rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. The most important of the rotator cuff is the supraspinatus muscle because it is the most common muscle affected with the rotator cuff pathology. The origin of the supraspinatus is from the supraspinous fossa. The insertion is on the greater tubercity. Nerve supply, suprascapular nerve. Function is to initiate abduction in the first 15 degree. Now, how we examine the supraspinatus muscle? We have the drop arm sign, and here the examiner is going to passively abduct the upper limb to 180 degree and let the patient drop his arm slowly. When the patient reaches 90 degree, he will drop his arm in an uncontrolled manner toward his body. And this is a positive drop arm sign and it indicates a complete tear of the supraspinatus muscle. Empty can sign. Here the patient is doing the impingement position, which is abduction, flexion, and internal rotation. And the ex and the examiner is going to resist the upward movement of the upper limb. Positive test is by feeling pain in the anterior aspect of the shoulder. And this indicates a rotator cuff muscle impingement or tendinitis. <clears throat> Infraspinatus. The origin is from the infraspinous fossa insertion on the greater tubercity, nerve supply, suprascapular nerve. Function is to external rotation or lateral rotation of the arm. The examiner is going to resist the external or lateral rotation movement of the arm while the arm is adducted to the trunk. Here is minor. 
Origin is from the infraspinous fossa. Insertion is on the greater tuberosity. Nerve supply, axillary nerve. Function is to external rotate of the arm while the arm is abducted from the body. So the same way we examine the infraspinatus, external rotation of the arm, but here we do external rotation while the arm is 45 degree abducted from the body. Subscapularis, origin from the subscapular fossa, insertion is on the lesser tuberosity, nerve supply, upper and lower subscapular nerve. Function is to internal rotation of the upper limb. How we examine the subscapularis by left of test. Here, the patient is going to put his hand behind his back and to push away from his back while the examiner is going to resist this movement. Patient with subscapularis pathology will feel pain and weakness of his movement away from his body. Billy press test. Here the, ex the patient is going to press against his belly and do internal rotation of the shoulders. Weakness in this movement suggests subscapularis tear. And even if the patient stay for 30 to 60 seconds doing a press belly test and internally rotated his shoulder, he will feel pain in the anterior aspect of the shoulder. Now we are going to move to the superficial muscle group. The first muscle we are going to talk about is the deltoid muscle, which has anterior, middle, and posterior fiber. Deltoid muscle supplied by the axillary nerve. It has a wide origin from the shoulder, and it inserted on the humeral shaft. Nerve supply is axillary nerve. The function of the deltoid muscle is to do abduction after the initiation of abduction by the supraspinatus muscle. Also, the anterior fiber will assess the biceps in the flexion of the shoulder and the posterior fiber will assist in extension of the shoulder. Pectoralis major. The origin is from the chest wall and the sternum, and the insertion is on the humeral shaft, lateral to the bicipital groove. The nerve supply is the medial and lateral pectoral nerve. The function is to adduct the upper limb. Latissimus dorsi, it has a wide origin from the spinous process of the thoracolumbar vertebrae and the iliac crest and inserted in the humeral shaft around the bicipital group. The nerve supply is the thoracodorsal nerve. Biceps muscle. The long head originated from the supraglenoid area and the short head originated from the coracoid. Both heads joined each other to be inserted on the radial tuberosity. Nerve supply, musculocutaneous nerve. The function of the biceps, flexion of the shoulder, the long head flex the shoulder and assist the brachialis muscle in flexion of the elbow and supination of the elbow. How we examine the biceps muscle? Speed test. So the patient is going to do forward flexion about 90 degree with his palm facing the ceiling. And the examiner is going to resist upward movement. If the patient has biceps tendon tear, he, there will be a weakness and if the patient has tendinitis, he will feel pain in the anterior aspect of the shoulder joint. 
Here gives me this. The patient is going to adduct his arm to the trunk and pronate his forearm. Then the examiner is going to resist to resist the supination of the forearm. Patient with biceps pathology will feel pain and weakness. This examination is very important in the distal biceps avulsion injury. So the examiner will, will feel weakness of the supination of the forearm. Here is the origin insertion in the humeral shaft. As we see, supraspinatus insertion on the greater tuberosity, subscapularis on the lesser tuberosities. And latissimus dorsi is inserted around the bicipital groove and pectoralis major is lateral to the bicipital groove. Deltoid tuberosity where there is insertion of the deltoid muscle. Infraspinatus teres minor insertion on the greater tuberosity posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. Serratus anterior. This muscle originates from the rib and inserted on the medial aspect of the scapula. It is supplied by the long thoracic nerve. Medial winging of the scapula is due to long thoracic nerve injury and serratus anterior muscle dysfunction. We ask the patient to push against the wall and the scapula will be elevated from the back and that is called the medial winging of the scapula. Trabezius, which is supplied by the spinal accessory nerve, has a wide origin. Lateral winging of the scapula is due to spinal accessory nerve injury and the trabezius dysfunction. The shoulder will be depressed, the scapula is translated laterally, and the inferior angle will rotate it laterally. After finishing the dynamic stabilizer of the shoulder, which are the superficial muscle group and the deep muscle group, we will move to the static stabilizer. We have four static stabilizers of the shoulder joints. The ligaments. We have multiple ligaments around the shoulder joint. The coracoclavicular ligament, which is composed of the conoid and the trapezoid ligament. The acromioclavicular ligament, the coracoacromial ligaments, the coracohumeral ligaments, the transverse humeral ligaments, the superior glenohumeral ligaments, the middle glenohumeral ligaments, and the inferior glenohumeral ligaments. The second stabilizer of the shoulder joints is the ball and socket articulation between the glenoids and the humeral head. It is a shallow articulation. The third stabilizer of the shoulder joint is the capsule. And the fourth stabilizer of the shoulder joint is the labrum. The labrum, it is a fibrocartilaginous complex that deepen the shoulder joint by 30 persons. So it increases the stability of the shoulder joint. Now we are going to move to the pathologies of the, of the muscles. First pathology we are going to speak about is the calcific tendinitis. It is a calcium deposition that develops within the rotator cuff tendon, especially the supraspinatus tendon. The patient will present with night pain. And while doing the physical examination, there will be a localized tenderness 
over the greater tuberosity. The management is by activity modification, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, extracorporeal shockwave, steroid injection, and finally by surgery. If the patient is not responding to the conservative management, Rotator cuff impingement. Around the shoulder joints, there is multiple bursa. The bursa is a fluid-filled sac that prevents friction between muscle and bone. The most important bursa is the subacromial bursa. It is beneath the arch between the acromion and coracoid. And this bursa, when inflamed, it will lead to impingement on the supraspinatus muscle. It will lead to compression of the supraspinatus muscles. And this will make the space for the supraspinatus smaller, and that will lead to pain. The compression is in the supraspinatus outlet. As we can see, when the patient starting to have compression of the supraspinatus muscle by the bursa, this will lead to tendinitis and inflammation of the supraspinatus tendon. The patient will present by pain that awakens from sleep, and by physical examination, we will feel weakness and loss of mobility of the shoulder joint. The management is first we start by conservative treatment, which is rest and activity modification, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, physiotherapy injections, and if there is no improvement on conservative treatment, we will move to the surgical treatment. Rotator cuff tendinitis. Here, the patient will present with the symptoms of the rotator cuff impingement. There is pain, inflammation, and irritation of the supraspinatus tendons. The patient will have a pain that awakens him from sleep, and night pain. Also, the impingement sign, which is when we, the patient is doing forward deflection, abduction, and internal rotations, the patient will feel pain when is resisted by the examiner. The pain will be over the anterior lateral part of the shoulder and is exaggerated by overhead activities. Night pain is a frequent symptom, especially when the patient lies on the affected shoulder. The patient will have weakness and loss of shoulder motion. The management is to stop the activity, mainly the overhead activities. We apply ice, give the patient anti-inflammatory drug, and light exercise and physiotherapy, and give the patient injections. If the patient is not improving on the conservative treatment, we will move to the surgery. A rotator cuff tear is a common cause of pain and disability among adults. Most tears occur in the supraspinatus tendon, but other parts of the rotator cuff may also be involved. In many cases, torn tendons begin by fraying of the tendon. As the damage progresses, the tendon can completely tear, sometimes with lifting a heavy object. We classify rotator cuff tear into partial thickness tear and full thickness tear. We can also classify the tears into acute tear or traumatic tear in the young people. The patient will present with intense pain. There may be a snapping sensation and immediate weakness in young in the upper arm. 
Radiological investigation on the X-ray, AP view show a high riding humerus relative to the glenoid in massive tear. On the MRI, we can show a loss of continuity of the supraspinatus tendon around one inch before the insertion on the greater tuberosity. There is loss of continuity and fluid signal as the white arrow shows. So the management will depend. It is partial or for thickness tear. It usually we start with conservative for partial tear and direct repair of the rotator cuff back to its bony insertion on the greater tuberosity for full thickness tear. The degenerative rotator cuff tear, usually we see this pathology in the elderly people after repetitive movement and overhead activities. There is no history of a trauma. The management is by activity modification, pain medication, and physiotherapy to strengthen the rotator cuff and scapular stabilizer. We have to think a lot before doing the surgery because there is a lot of contraindication to doing surgery in the elderly people because they have little capability for healing. Rotator cuff pathology is a cyclic pathology. It started with tendinitis that will lead to edema. Edema will lead to thickened tendon. Thickened tendon will lead to impingement. Impingement will lead to tear and usually degenerative tear and the tear will lead to more edema and the edema will lead to more impingement and pain usually at night. The bicipital tendinitis and biceps tendon ruptures, we can diagnose them clinically and by the speed test for the long head and ear gizon test. Now moving to the pathology of the capsule, frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. The patient will present with progressive pain and stiffness. It is usually idiopathic and usually associated with diabetes. In secondary adhesive capsulitis, most of the time due to prolonged immobilization and sometimes it is associated with shoulder hand syndrome and following myocardial infarction, shoulder stiffness will occur and also in stroke and shoulder trauma. It is much co more common in women than in men. 70% of patients are women aged 40 to 60. The, the patient will present with initially pain and tenderness that may resolve and leave the shoulder with painless but limited range of motion. The scarring of the shoulder joint capsule may limit the ability to move the shoulder fully in all the normal course of a frozen shoulder has been described as having three stages. The freezing or painful stage up to six months. The pain will worsen and the shoulder movement will be lost over the time. The frozen or adhesive stage from six to 12 months, there is a slow improvement in pain, but the stiffness remains. The recovery phase is from one year to one to 18 months when the shoulder motion slowly returns toward normal. We can diagnose frozen shoulder by history, physical examination, and arthrography, which is an X-ray with contrast dye injected into the shoulder joint to demonstrate the shrunken shoulder capsule. The tissue of the shoulder can also be evaluated with an MRI. 
Management. Medical treatment by aggressive combination of anti-inflammatory medication and steroid injection. Physical therapy include electrical stimulation, range of motion exercise, maneuver, ice packs, and eventually strengthen exercise. Other treatments such as release of the scar tissue by arthroscopic surgery or manipulation of the scar shoulder under anesthesia may be considered for patient with resistant frozen shoulder. After we finished the pathologies of the muscle around the shoulder joint, we will move to the pathologies around of the joints. First joints, we, which we will going to describe the pathology about is the acromioclavicular joint. The first pathology is osteoarthrosis of the ac acromioclavicular joint. The patient will present with anterior shoulder pain. And upon doing X-ray for the patient, there will be narrowing of the joint space, subchondral sclerosis, osteophyte formations. And when we do the crossover test, and by adducting the upper limb, the patient will feel pain in the anterior aspect of the shoulder. Acromioclavicular joint dislocation. It is classified into six grades according to the displacement. The management is conservative or surgical depends on the grade of the injury. Management for the acromioclavicular joint osteoarthrosis is activity modification, pain medication, injection, and surgery, which include distal clavicle resection. The shoulder joint is very shallow and relies heavily on the rotator cuff muscles and the cartilage lip around the glenoid for its stability. It is therefore relatively easy to dislocate. Types of shoulder dislocation, anterior around 95%, posterior and inferior. It is more common in male and 80% is from 15 to 30 years old. The mechanism due to trauma or fall is in 60% of the patients. The mechanism of injury is abduction and external rotation. It is the throwing position of the baseball player. In anterior dislocation, the patient will present with pain, tenderness, and deformity, flat deltoid. The arm is held in slight abduction, external rotation, and there will be squaring of the shoulder. Most of the anterior dislocation are subcoracoid, that means anterior inferior position of the humeral head. The risk factors is male, teen or patient around 20s, people in this age group tend to have a high level of physical activity, which can possibly increase the risk of injury. Condition involve loose joints such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome increase the risk of shoulder dislocation and poor muscle tone. Over 95% of shoulder dislocation cases are anterior. Most of the anterior dislocation are subcoracoid, usually caused by direct blow or fall on the outstretched arm, the patient typically appears holding their arm externally rotated and slightly abducted. It can result in damage to the axillary artery and axillary nerve, C5, C, C6. So examination, first of all, the most important is to get neurovascular bundle before and after reduction of the shoulder dislocation.
The patient will present with a flattened shoulder or squaring of the shoulder. In this patient, on the left side, there is the shoulder has a round contour. On the right side, there is a squaring or flattening of the shoulder joints and an empty glenoid. So if we press against the glenoid, we will feel an empty glenoid. There is no resistance from the humeral head. The patient will be in severe pain and inability to move his upper limb. So we have to examine the nerve, which is most likely to be injured the axillary nerve. And since the patient is having severe pain and limitation of movement, we will examine the sensory part of the axillary nerve, which is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm over an area called the deltoid patch. So we examine the lateral aspect of the arm. The management is to do an urgent close reduction. The reduction must be under sedation to get the muscle relaxed. And we have to do post reduction X-ray. The X-ray should be done pre and post reduction because sometimes shoulder dislocation is associated with tuberosity fracture. After we have done with our close reduction, we will do immobilization in arm sling, ice application, rehabilitation exercise after that to strengthen the muscle, pain medication, either non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or acetaminophen that will help relieve the pain. Posterior shoulder dislocation. It is commonly missed injury due to poor physical examination and radiograph. The mechanism is abduction internally rotated arm. It happened in seizure and electrical shock or due to blow to the anterior shoulder. The clinical feature, the arm is held in abduction and internal rotation. The investigation is by doing X-ray, AP, transscapular axillary views, and sometimes we need a CT scan. Maybe caused by strength imbalance of the rotator cuff muscle. The posterior dislocation, which is often go unnoticed, especially in elderly patient and in the unconscious trauma patient. The characteristic light appearance bulb on the X-ray is characteristic for posterior dislocation. Inferior dislocation and compromise around 1% of the shoulder dislocation. The patient present to the emergency room with his arm hyper abducted position and in severe pain. It is associated with high complication rate as many vascular, neurological, tendon and ligament injury are likely to occur. Moving to the injury of the static stabilizer of the shoulder joint, we will now speak about Bankert lesion, which is a separation of the glenoid labrum from the margin of the glenoid cavity. This lesion is called Bankert lesion. Usually the lesion in the anterior inferior margin of the labrum and it is associated with shoulder dislocation because the most common direction of the shoulder dislocation is anterior inferior and this will lead to anterior inferior injury of the labrum. It is a detachment. Sometimes we have a fracture of the glenoid cavity, and this is called bony banker lesion. The fracture is in the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid. Banker lesion will 
lead to instability of the shoulder joints because the glenoid and the labrum is the static stabilizer for the shoulder joints. Hill sac lesion, it is a depressed fracture, compression fracture, indentation in the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head due to impaction again the anterior rim of the glenoid again the most common direction for shoulder dislocation is anterior inferior so as the head is moving to the anterior inferior position the posterolateral aspect of the humeral head will be compressed against the anterior aspect of the glenoids and that will lead to a depressed fracture or indentation. The management is by doing surgery, repair of the labral tear and this will resume the stability of the shoulder joint. Moving to the elbow joint, we will start by describing the elbow joint it composes of three joints the first joint is between the capitulum and the radial head the second joint is between the trochlea and the ulnar notch the ulnar notch has an anterior process which is called coronoid process and a posterior process which is called Electronic process. The electronic process get the insertion of the triceps muscle. The third joint is the proximal radio ulnar joint, which has the pronation supination movements and the attachments of the annular ligaments. We have the radial tuberosity, which has the insertion of the biceps tendon. Range of motion for the elbow joint is the flexion extension from 0 to 140. Supination and pronation movements, which occur mainly at the proximal radio ulnar joint. The stabilizer of the elbow joint is the bony structure, the ulnar notch articulating with the trochlea and the capitulum articulation with the, radial, with the radial head which prevent the vulgus force of the forearm and the ligaments we have both lateral ligaments and medial ligaments the lateral collateral ligament complex composed of radial collateral ligament lateral ulnar collateral ligaments the annular ligaments is the ligaments around the radial heads to the ulna and it is for the proximal radio ulnar joints the medial on the medial aspects there is medial collateral ligaments which compose of anterior part posterior part and transverse part muscles around the elbow joints from the lateral epicondyle, there is origin for the common extensor muscles of the wrist, which is supplied by the radial nerve. And there are three muscles, brachioradialis, extensor carpiradialis longus, and brevis, which inserted into the base of the second and third metacarpal bone they are in the posterior forearm muscles they are the second extensor compartment of the extensor muscles in the forearm from the medial epicondyle there is origin of the common flexors of the wrist with the pronator teres muscle Biceps muscle, which is supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve, both the long head and the short head inserted on the radial tuberosity. 
The main function on the elbow joint is supination. And this is, is examined by Gergizontis, which is active resisted supination of the forearm. Also, the biceps muscle will assist the brachialis in flexion of the elbow. Brachialis muscle, origin from the humor, humeral shaft, insertion on the ulna, and nerve supply is the musculocutaneous nerve. The main function of the brachialis is flexion of the elbow joints. Triceps brachii with the three head, the long lateral and middle head, they are joined together to be inserted on the olecranon process. The main function is extension of the elbow joints and this is examined by resisted extension of the elbow joints against the gravity. Triceps muscle is supplied by the radial nerve. Pathology of the joint. Elbow dislocation. 90% of the elbow dislocation is posterior elbow dislocation. We have to do careful examination of the associated injury, which include bony fracture, such as radial head injury or coronoid process injury, and ligament in injuries, injuries of the medial collateral or lateral collateral ligaments of the elbow joint. Posterior dislocations are the most common, around 90% of the time, and it has a high incidence in young people between 10 to 20 years old, usually during sport injuries. Other type of elbow dislocation, anterior dislocation, lateral dislocation, medial dislocation, and divert Divergent dislocation. Elbow dislocation with radial head and coronoid process fracture are known as a terrible triad due to the association with instability of the, of the elbow joint. The management is urgent close reduction after a neurovascular examination then we do splint ice pain medication. After we, we've done with the close reduction, we have to examine the elbow joint for the stability of the elbow joints. Unstable elbow joints after reduction, usually they need surgeries. And if the lateral collateral ligaments involved, then surgical intervention to repair these ligaments. Pathology of the muscle. The first pathology we are going to talk about is lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. It is a micro tear of the common extensor muscle of the wrist, which originated from the lateral epicondyle, brachioradialis, extensor carburadialis longus, and extensor carburadialis brevis. Mainly the pathology is in extensor carburadialis brevis. It is due to forceful repetitive wrist extension. We see this injury in tennis players and who's doing repetitive wrist extension movement. Every physical examination starts with look, feel, move, special test. So while doing the feel, the patient has a localized tenderness over the lateral epicondyle. In the special test, we are going to do cousin's test, which is the forearm is kept pronated and the wrist is radially deviated. The patient will do active extension of the wrist and the examiner is going to resist this 
movement, the patient will feel pain and weakness. The pain will be mainly in the lateral epicondyle area. Other tests include the elbow is held in extension and the wrist will be passively flexed. So this will do tension on the lateral epicondyle and the patient will feel pain in the lateral epicondyle area. The management of lateral epicondyle include wrist counter force brace, which is a brace on the forearm to counter force the actions of the extensor muscle. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, wrist splinting, steroid injection, low-level le low laser therapy, and extracorporeal shock wave will help the patients with tennis elbow pathology. And finally, new modalities is the plasma rich plate. This will help the patient to heal the micro tear. Approximately 90 to 95% of the patients will respond to, to conservative measures and do not require surgical intervention. Patients whose condition is unresponsive to six months of conservative therapy, including steroid injection, are the one who indicated for surgical intervention. Medial epicondylitis, golfal elbow. It is an inflammation and micro tear of the medial epicondyle common flexor and pronator's muscles. The patient will present with pain on the medial sides and the ulnar nerve compression symptoms is present in high percentage of patients because ulnar nerve pass behind the medial epicondyles and inflammation will lead to edema and compression of the ulnar nerve in the cubital tunnel and the examination of the medial epicondylitis the patient will have localized tenderness and the medial epicondyle. So we are going to do active resisted flexion of the wrist joint while the forearm is supinated and the patient will feel pain in the area of the medial epicondyle. Or we can do passive extension of the wrist while the forearm is supination. Again, again, this will lead to tension on the flexor muscles and pain on the medial epicondyle. Management the same as tennis elbow, wrist counter force, brace, wrist non-steroidal, wrist splint, steroid injection, low-level laser therapy and extracorporeal shock wave and plasma rich plate. Avulsion of the distal tendon of the biceps. The patient will present with a history of a trauma. There is loss of supination power with the elbow flex, which is Jergeson test will be positive. On inspection, there will be ecchymosis around the elbow joints and a mass or a bulb, which is the retracted biceps tendon, and this is called Popeye's sign. In avulsion of the distal tendon of the biceps, the results of early surgery and care for rehabilitation are usually very good. Olecranon bursitis, it is an enlarged bursa as a result of continual pressure or friction. This is used to be called student's elbow. The causes are trauma, gout, and in gout we will see calcification on the x-ray and in rheumatoid arthritis patient.
Chronic enlarged bursa may need to be excised. However, wound healing can be a problem. Thank you for being in this lecture of shoulder and elbow joints, anatomy, pathologies, and examination.